As it flows through the nation's heartland, the Mississippi River touches the lives of many people, both in cities and in rural areas. This father of rivers drains all or part of 31 states, with headwaters reaching to Canada. The Delta region of the Mississippi begins at the southern tip of Illinois. It then continues to the Gulf of Mexico, covering a good portion of the states along the way. Wintertime on the Delta is often a season of drenching rain. This area was originally North America's largest rainforest. The Mississippi would deposit a layer of sediment every year as it pulsed beyond its banks. The fertile soil gave rise to great forests of oak, ash, cypress, and other species. Within this long strip of woodlands, many species of wildlife could coexist and thrive. From a landscape perspective, the Lower Mississippi Valley starts at Cairo, Illinois, goes to the Gulf of Mexico. It is approximately 21 million acres of uh, historically bottomland hardwood forest. Uh, now there's only about 4 million acres of that land left, and most of those uh, forest lands would be considered wetlands. When the Europeans uh, first settled this country, uh, that continuous forest harbored a number of uh, wildlife species such as bear, cougar, deer, turkey, passenger pigeon, ivy beetle woodpecker. The alluvial floodplain that made this valley through the formation of sediments, deposition of sediments, meandering back and forth from hill to hill, from Arkansas, Louisiana Hills, over to the Lursal Bluff Hills of Mississippi, uh, was a, was a extreme complexity of streams that uh, uh, deposited sediments over historical time and, and it was a, a valley, is a valley, of very rich soils. And therefore, the agricultural interest, once discovering this piece of land, uh, moved in very slowly over the next 200 years and began to settle this area. Starting from the Gulf and going north, the whole delta system is, is geologically young. It started since the last ice age. The river brought the sediments downstream and as the sea level began to rise, as the ice caps began to melt, uh, it, it formed our marshes, a very important intertidal zone or, or zone of, of transition between the uplands and the open, open waters of the Gulf of Mexico. You know, the Mississippi River has been modified because it is a, a truly important waterway for the, for the continental United States. Tremendous amount of interstate commerce up and down the river, and it has been levied for navigation and flood control. And there are some people who say, tear down the levees and let the river have its way with the land. Obviously, we can't do that. Uh, we've got to think of people, we've got to think of the, the, the resources that's there that we need to have as a people. But having looked at that, then what's the next best thing to do that we can do to treat the resource needs of the land and, and also affect the river in a positive way? Native Americans farmed the rich land, leaving a footprint upon the landscape and on the original vegetation. At Poverty Point in Louisiana, Mounds and ridges mark these early settlements. The first evidence we have really of prehistoric people in the area is really by some of the projectile points we're finding in the area, uh, which is known as Clovis points. Uh, Clovis points would date back to about 11,000 to 11,500 years ago. Agriculture really coming into use somewhere around 1000 AD and uh, by historic contact times, agriculture was of course widespread, bow and arrow used, and well-made pottery, and populations were uh, fairly dense in most regions in the Delta area. Most of the native vegetation in the Delta has been cleared for agriculture over the last uh, couple of hundred years. It's not that uh, we've just done it as the Europeans have moved in here, though that clearing took place long before the Europeans came into uh, the lower Mississippi Valley, but it was done extensively and has been really cleared a whole lot more of late. There are still a number of really great remnants of the natural vegetation around within the batcher itself, which is inside the, the levees close to, to the river. You see the riverfront hardwoods, the, 
the willow cottonwood areas, the sugarberry and that sort of thing. As late as 1900, much of the Delta's forest remained intact. Most of the cleared farmland was confined to the well-drained upland areas. Looking at the same region in the early 1980s shows that this is no longer the case. The solid blocks of forest have mostly been cleared for agriculture, even in the once flooded bottomlands. The 20th century brought great progress in flood control through levees and dams along the Mississippi. Once the flood water was held back, the land could be farmed. However, that land had now lost a critical source of fertility. The major changes that have occurred have been the almost total elimination of the natural systems functioning from this deposition, a great deposition of alluvium. So this slow inundation of this major floodplain and then the movement of the water out into the to the river system itself caused this great exchange of nutrients, uh, sediments, which refertilized basically. As, as we look at it now, it's, it was an exchange of fertility through the natural uh, organic materials and organic sediments here. So all of this provided for a tremendously rich ecosystem uh, historically and even now uh, to a large degree. But the effect on the basic elements of, of land, forest, and aquatic systems has, has been dramatic over the time that has been cleared. Bottom lands were then cleared at an increased rate and the forests rapidly disintegrated. Commodity prices were high and land was in great demand. New mechanical farming methods allowed for incredible efficiencies in production. Between 1950 and 1970, approximately 11 million acres of bottomland hardwood forest was moved, removed. And of course, part of that was related to the soybean years, as we call it, the high price of soybeans. Uh, it was an economic movement to, to uh, increase production. Uh, everybody agreed that it was a good thing to do. And I think that now we see, and many farmers will tell you, that some of the lands that were cleared at that time probably should not have been cleared. Sarbings uh, were such a big demand, price was high, a lot of this marginal land was cleared up. And right now, the table has turned. Uh, beans are low, the marginal land is, is very, it's, it's not as productive. Uh, so they are, they are taking advantage of, of opportunities uh, to restore that land back. Indeed, there was a price to be paid. By so radically altering the hydrology, the natural flow of nutrients into the soil was cut off. Resident fish populations also suffered from the increasingly sediment-laden waters and blocked migration routes. The replumbing of the the region through the dams and through the uh, levee systems uh, uh, made dramatic difference in the aquatic systems here. From an ecological perspective, it's very important that that flooding maintain its historical periodicity. In other words, you want to be sure, even though flooding can occur at any time of the year, that flooding is most important when it occurs during the winter and spring because that's when the aquatic invertebrates have access to most of the organic material that was derived from the vegetation on the terrestrial component of that system. Those aquatic invertebrates in turn become a primary food source for a lot of fishes that move from the main channel of the river onto the floodplain. And whenever we keep the floodwaters off of the floodplain, obviously the productive potential from that organic material is just not available to the fishery that would be associated with that ecosystem. Many of the native and migratory species that depended upon the forested wetlands and backwater areas disappeared. Important fishery resources dwindled as habitat was dredged or dammed. There are certain fishes in these systems that do not do very well when you change the hydrology of the system. For example, uh, if you're dealing with flood control, that incorporates the two dimensions of, say, an upstream system of dams and a downstream system of dredging or channelization. Uh, 
fishes that would normally move upstream for spawning purposes, if they don't have a way to get around those dams, and here in Mississippi they don't, those dams cut off the migration of fishes. And another thing that we need to bear in mind is that fish that once were very important commercial species in the lower Mississippi River ecosystem, such as the blue sucker, now are becoming more and more rare. Although we still find them, we find that they're not in the abundance that they once were. And in fact, if you dredge a river, our research has shown that you have declines in the abundance of blue sucker, but you increase the abundance of exotic fishes such as the common carp. As the channel of the Mississippi meandered, it created several oxbow lakes. Now that the levee system had separated these lakes from the flooding river, they too have become altered. These oxbow lakes are indigenous to river systems here in the Delta. Um, and uh, these lakes are cut off from the Mississippi River now. Uh, at one time, uh, during the normal flood regime, uh, these lakes were replenished. But now these lakes are cut off, and typically there are no drainages that are associated with them, or very few drainages that are associated with these oxbow lakes. Several things can be done to restore fishery populations in these oxbow lakes here in the Delta. We want to pay particular attention to landscapes and watersheds that surround these lakes because what happens on the land eventually affects what happens in these oxbow lakes. Farming practices have a big role in this. Not only do farming practices have a big, play a big role, but uh, municipal drainage systems uh, and sewage systems play a big role in this. Um, we want to pay particular attention to conservation practices such as grass waterways, vegetative filter strips, riparian buffers, because if we can treat the non-point source pollution that flows off the land before it makes it to the lake, then we have a very good chance of increasing or conserving water quality in these oxbow lakes. Loss of habitat wasn't limited to aquatic species. Large mammals and migratory birds depended upon the contiguous forest. Some of those areas are now being reforested in hopes of reconnecting the fragments. In Mississippi, the black bear is now on the endangered species list. Historically, they were found throughout Mississippi in, in great abundance if you read the old accounts from people who first moved to Mississippi. But of course, as agriculture moved in, people cleared um, um, forestry practices. All those things led to the clearing of the land, which is part of the reason that we lost the black bear population. Having habitats that connect are very important in Mississippi, especially in the Delta, as we've said, um, because we don't have those large contiguous areas. Having those small, what we call corridors, even very small areas that, that connect uh, one large patch of woods to another is extremely important because these bears can be up to 400 pounds, so they need a lot of food. So they do have to move around quite a bit to find enough food to get through the year. And so they need to have access from one area to another since we don't have those vast thousands and thousands of acres as they do in the western part of the U.S. Connecting these remnants is really critical. One is for the movement of a number of wildlife species for birds along the uh, riparian quarters and that sort of thing. But it's also important as uh, vegetation will move along that thing. It's carried by the water courses, it'll be dropped out with overbank flooding, and hopefully through the connectivity, if you happen to have something, say, like pondberry, which is an endangered plant in the area, some of that may get picked up and moved through a connecting corridor and dropped out someplace else, and uh, keep that, that restoration moving and start to get the whole system in there. Uh, Tensaw River National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1980 uh, to protect some of the largest uh, block of bottlenet hardwoods left in the area. Tensaw River is a 66,000 acre uh, block of bottlenet hardwood forest uh, and it's really it's sitting in a sea of agriculture. So we're trying to connect Tensaw River with refuges to the north and also to the south. Uh, we're trying to establish a connectivity uh, via reforestation uh, using uh, working closely with USDA, WRP programs, CRP programs and on-site uh, refuge reforestation. We're trying to establish corridors along the, the delta all the way to the south and also, like I said, to the north to uh, Arkansas. Neotropical songbirds also would benefit from reforestation, not just the Louisiana black bear. Uh, when these birds migrate down, they will have a, a stop-off point and a resting point to continue their migration south. Socially, the progressive farming methods left many workers behind. 
A mechanical harvester could now do the work of hundreds of field hands. The future of this valley is going to be dependent upon how we address the problems, both uh, culturally, socially, uh, as we look at it from a society, and, and as we relate as a society to the resources. The problem I'm referring to primarily is the dramatic cultural change that took place through technology development post-World War II, where the economy was based, agricultural economy was based primarily upon hand labor, and now we have machines to do that work. Someone said that a four-row cotton picker, now they make six-row cotton pickers, but a four-row cotton picker replaced about 500 people. One picker did about what 500 people could do 50 years ago. So you can see, if that's even close to accurate, what a tremendous difference that that has made in, uh, in, the, in the number of people that work on a farm. Our new century finds this manipulated landscape in a state of change. Many producers have found ways to balance ecological considerations with production concerns. Some have found that the economics of conservation can help the farm's bottom line. New developments in tillage and integrated pest management can further help to attain that balance. I think the biggest change that I've seen is less tillage, more water conservation, uh, more recycling of, of, of things that we, that we use on the place. We've been, we've been recycling those kind of things uh, as opposed to just burying them or burning them or discarding them in other fashions. But I think the biggest thing I've, I've seen is more conservation of, of what, we, what we have here. There was a time when, when it was farmed from ditch bank to ditch bank. And uh, that was just the way you did it, to be able to manage your pest, to be able to manage the weeds. Now with technology, we're able to manage the pest with fewer amounts of, of uh, pesticides and herbicides. And so that leaves us other options to be able to control some of the, some of the pests that are associated with those uh, buffers. Now, the other reason is to control erosion. The Mississippi Delta is rolling. It's not just completely flat and we have uh, over 50 inches of rain in a year. And so if you till the soil and leave it completely exposed to Mother Nature, then you're gonna have some topsoil just simply wash away. Not only does it pollute our rivers and streams, but in addition to that, it takes away the productivity of the soil. It strips it away. The reduced tillage that we have, have seen in the last seven or eight years, we think is, re is, is allowing less soil erosion. And I don't think it's any question about it that, that you're seeing the benefits of that in, uh, in this river here. We can use uh, less high horsepower tractors, you know, less tillage, less, you know, labor, uh, less uh, economic expenditures to, to keep these implements going. So I think the the reduced tillage is, is, has a lot of benefits, not only for the environment, but for, but for us and our bottom line. We found the hard way that our soil, our sandy soil especially, the organic matter was, had gotten so low by continuously farming over the last many years that we couldn't use certain chemicals because it was not enough organic matter in the soil uh, to counteract the effects of the chemicals. So we had to increase the organic matter. We began a, a no-till program, and basically out of all our farm, we're either no-till or minimum till over the entire effect. What we have found in conservation tillage systems, just as the, the physical nature of the soil and fertility has changed, the soil biotic structure has changed as well, both just below the soil and at the soil plant interface. Many, uh, not only pest species, are being increased in their diversity, but we're also increasing the density and abundance of non-pest species. An example of one of these insects is red imported fire ant. That's a common pest in many lawns in Louisiana. This is an extremely effective predator of a number of pest species in areas where there is a lack of disturbance. In other words, by reducing tillage, we increase the abundance of this so-called pest, which in row crop areas turns out to be a beneficial.
in the early 80s to mid 80s, so we had an economic crisis and we're cutting back on a lot of inputs. And oddly enough, uh, no-till strategies started to be look impressive by number of trips and so forth. And uh, we really started exploring what else is out there in the environment that we can consider as a resource. We have production resources, borrowing money, buying equipment, and that kind of thing. But what's existing in our farm area that could be of benefit to us? And we're trying not only to address the preservation of the land and the water and those issues that are so important to society, but what does it do for the long haul for this piece of far this farm and, and our family? And, and what, what is it that we're going to leave to them? And so the health of the property is more complex than we had ever dreamed before uh, 15 years ago. So as a result, we have a number of things that have happened on the place that I find not only a treat to see the return of wildlife, but also our productivity as a farm operation and also the productivity of the land in preserving that. What do we do to, to hold the nutrients and the pesticides on the land with, with producers, uh, with private landowners who's farming the land to make a living? Uh, the priority then becomes treating the land in a total resource management way. It's not just enough to uh, leave residue on the land. We've got to maintain or manage the riparian areas, those areas that are receiving waters from those fields. Growers and myself, I think we have a new responsibility that's brought, been brought to our attention, not only through uh, uh, legislation, but also society needs, that we are part of a greater um, idea, uh, we're regard, part of a greater watershed, part of this country. So my efforts here on our property do impact other people and the environment and water quality and those issues. So. I don't think we can see ourselves as an isolated entity any longer. We have a bigger responsibility uh, at large. You've got to address on-farm problems with producers that's trying to make a living there. They've got to make the decisions that fit their pocketbook and at the same time fit the resource needs. But if you don't have a vision from a, from a broader watershed or a basin approach, then we don't know what this puzzle is going to look like. But it goes hand in hand uh, with production. It's better, you've got the equipment now, you've got the chemicals that you can do minimum till. And when you do minimum till, and you do uh, the grass waterways and do the equip program, you're gonna have, your, your farm's gonna uh, react uh, naturally. Uh, you're gonna find it's a lot easier farming. It's a different type of farm, you don't have to farm ugly. My father still hadn't gotten used to that idea. Ecological restoration can also create new business enterprises in the Delta. Growing the seedlings required for reforestation is a labor-intensive process. Tree nurseries provide opportunity for the area's labor force. Outdoor recreation also creates economic opportunities. The purpose of this nursery is, is actually threefold. One was to uh, produce a high-quality native bottomland hardwood seedling for reforestation purposes. Uh, the second purpose was for education for our local schools, our children on wetland issues and wetland education and other environmental education issues. And also the purpose of the nursery was to uh, serve as a training facility for uh, local landowners who would be interested in starting their own uh, private uh, hardwood seedling nurseries. We have uh, worked with five different landowners to help them develop their own seedling nurseries here in the area. Uh, seedling nurseries are very labor intensive and in that uh, during harvest and planting time, uh, several people are needed to work in the nursery to harvest the seedlings. It has really worked well for us in that our busy times of the year are December, January, February, the winter months. And that's normally when most of the uh, farmers' employees are laid off. The common bottomland hardwood species that we're raising are uh, primarily oaks. We're looking at uh, nut all oak, water oak. We're looking at cypress, green ash, uh, native sweet pecan, hackberry or sugarberry, sweet gum. That's the primary species that, that, that are going back into the reforestation efforts. Recreation is a growing thing right now. It's big business and uh, this is an opportunity for landowners to diversify the site. Uh, one thing here, one thing we stress in Madison is that uh, wildlife and cropland can work together. 
We, we strive to save the soil, we strive to improve water quality, and we know that uh, wildlife is, a, is something that we have to provide habitat for. In the past, the rivers have, in many uh, people's minds, been perceived of as a threat uh, or at least a nuisance. And now people are beginning to understand that we can live with those rivers. Uh, we can uh, encourage people to come and enjoy those rivers. Uh, there are economic opportunities, uh, tourism opportunities particularly, where people are looking to connect with the culture of the Deep South. And to be able to go on one of these old rivers is to uh, link up again with the rhythms of the earth, to uh, experience something that is uh, almost ancient in, in terms of uh, its functioning on a landscape level. Ninety percent of the delta hardwoods, for instance, have disappeared. Uh, with that, the potential for a diversified uh, economy has disappeared. This is primarily a row crop agricultural uh, economy all the way up and down the lower Mississippi Valley. If we can bring some of the connectivity back in the wetland ecosystems and the ecology of, of the back swamp wetlands like we once had, we'd have the connectivity of habitat, we'd have a uh, lumber industry, we'd have an outdoor recreational industry of hunting and fishing, bird watching, all those kinds of things that have all of a sudden become really important to a lot of the American public. New partnerships are being formed around the common goal of helping the land. Through these and other efforts, a new picture is emerging of the Mississippi Delta landscape. We have a multi-agency work plan where we uh, use each other, find out just exactly what uh, other agencies may have uh, to assist the landowner because when I go out to a landowner, I don't look at the farm to see just exactly what we as NRCS could, could do to help him, but what resources are available to help this landowner to improve his whole operation. We want to do that in a, in a holistic way, and soil and water conservation districts are in existence from the Gulf all the way to the Canadian border. And it behooves us to look beyond those political boundaries state boundaries, county boundaries, parish boundaries, and really look at the boundaries of nature itself and work within the context of that, knowing that we've got to work with thousands of private landowners to make the right decisions on all those little pieces of the, of the puzzle of a much greater vision. Landowners hold the key to the conservation of this landscape. By keeping them connected with the land and empowered to make good decisions, the Delta's function can be improved. I love what I do. That's not to say that there aren't challenges on all sides, but there is just something fundamentally great about growing something and watching it happen. There's, there's a magic about it, and, and I don't know how to easily explain it, but there's so many other things that are contributing to that magic that I find very impressive and I want to be involved with. And, and that's what encourages me every day to, to look at. There's always a new set of experiences. There's also the history that you can draw upon what has come before you in, in the future. It's a real hopeful experience that even in the roughest of times, there's always this renew, this rebirth that, that can happen. And, and I, I find it just such a unique quality and being outdoors is even better. <laughs> So I hope to remain in that in some capacity and have a viable and profitable farm. There's no doubt about it, but I've got to find a balance between the farm resources and production resources, and at the end of the day, hopefully have not left a big footstep on the landscape. How do I juggle being productive as a producer with, uh, with wildlife management? And quite frankly, I don't see it as a problem at all. Uh, sometimes the, what, what, have, what have been viewed in the past as the, the best um, farming practices weren't necessarily the most economical. Now that we have new technologies to help control some of the weeds that native species that we allow to grow uh, in our filter strips and in our border areas, uh, if they get out in the field, they're not the problem that they were 10 or 15 years ago. 
So, uh, so you spend less time and you spend less money worrying about cleaning them. We're able to do some things that can change that habitat and provide an opportunity for different species to come back to do well on our farms. And that gives us all uh, a great deal of pleasure. The Mississippi connects life across a vast area of our nation. As the river flows on, so do good conservation practices. From one generation to the next, from one person to the next. In the last 15 years, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the expression of values associated with the rivers here in Mississippi. Uh, when I first came on board as a member of the faculty at Mississippi State University, uh, I felt like I was very alone. And uh, whenever there were issues associated with uh, conservation of rivers and their fisheries, um, there were just a few people that I could count on to stand with me, or at least I felt that way. But with time, it's been very heartening to see that people are stepping forward and saying, yes, our rivers do count. And I think what we're seeing is, is leaders in all of the communities and all of the states that make up this part of the lower Mississippi Valley coming together and saying, you know, we, we do need to do a better job here. And, and to me, that is rewarding because we see them recognize the fact that we do need to improve for the next generation. We do need to look at this thing as a landscape and how we may go about uh, advising and, and offering the kind of technical assistance that not only this agency, NRCS, but other agencies may offer and how we can, can work as partners and how we can work and put the farmer in the leadership role of making those right decisions out here. In just the last few years with uh, WRP programs and those kinds of restoration programs, we're seeing that habitat come back that is so important to being able to restore black bear populations. So there's a lot of changes, habitat changes as well as attitude changes that are extremely important to bring back the bear. The power of these rivers is incredible and they will prevail. Uh, we tend to think in terms of human time but not in terms of river time. And if we'll work with those rivers and enjoy the resources that they have and the wonderful influence that they can have over the entire landscape, not only in terms of just fisheries, but the aesthetic components, the backwater areas, the bottomland hardwood forest, and all the interactive components of those rivers, I think we come out the winners in the long run and we will be able to pass along a fabulous heritage to future generations.